Hello and welcome to Where To Go. I'm James Atkinson, Senior Brand Manager at DK Eyewitness. And I'm Lucy Richards, Senior Editor at DK Eyewitness. And welcome to Where To Go, where every fortnight we find out more about the world's favourite travel destinations from those people who know those places best. And today we're... We're doing a destination episode. Um, I'm sorry, Lister, if we keep messing with the format, uh, but we think this is worth it. So um, we are doing a destination episode and then we've got a little bit, something a little bit special at the end, which we are looking forward to Very a lot. Very excited about, yeah. So our destination today, we're going to Chiang Mai in Thailand. Um, yeah. Lucy, I think you've been to Thailand before, but maybe not to Chiang Mai, right? I've never been to Thailand. No, I know why you're thinking that. It's because my, it's because my best friend lives in Bangkok. That's, that's it. That's it. I think you've told me about, yeah, your fr- your uh, best friend Poppy moved to Bangkok, right? Yeah, exactly. So I keep meaning to go, but it's just because of various restrictions and all of those restrictions are being lifted. But that's why I haven't, Poppy moved in 20, last year, 2021. I just haven't been out because of sort of continuing restrictions but now as of now we can go so we're hoping to go um in winter because that's a good time to go we understand but no so I've never been to Thailand have you James I've never been no it's always been uh, it, it's one of the many many places on my kind of list but um uh yeah particularly from a food point of view I lo- I, I do love Thai, Thai food and yeah. would love to kind of experience it authentically and then it just it just looks like such a magical part of the world as well and quite quite different as well obviously you know lots of uk holiday makers know about the beaches and islands and so on yeah. and i think that's kind of uh, you know i never did that kind of traditional gap year and uh, saw no, so many people doing I. that but then yeah. actually i think the focus has increasingly gone north and um quite a lot of people i know have been raving about chiang mai which is where we're visiting today yes um which is kind of the biggest city in the north of thailand and um and very very different to your kind of your beaches and islands um much more uh, ancient and religious but also um a kind of mecca of um of, of expats kind of moving in and and, mm. and and you know kind of living harmoniously with locals so um yeah and i believe we are going to speak to one <laughs> yes so tell us james who is coming on to talk to us about chiang mai yes so lucy grace is a travel writer based in chiang mai um who writes for the likes of the i independent easy jet traveler usa today and the times and we're going to talk to lucy about chiang mai and thailand but she's also and this is this was the sort of something special not yeah. to ruin it for you guys but she's also just enjoyed a flight free summer of full of travel around europe went to loads of countries too many for nine, me to name. I think. nine countries nine, yeah. nine countries in total and um so we're going to talk to her a bit about how she managed to do that um and some of her flight free traveling tips as well so a bit of a hybrid episode but without further ado, let's say hello to Lucy. Hello. Hey. Hi, Lucy. It's our first other Lucy on the podcast. So welcome, This is welcome. true. This is going to be so confusing. <laughs> yes. um. I have to say that really surprises me because in every single school, class and university like group, <laughs> there was always three Lucys. So this yes. is... Yes, you're right. Actually, at one point in DK Witness, we did have three Lucys. Now we've got two. Very, very confusing. But thank you so much for joining us. I hope you won't be too confusing with for listeners with, with two Lucys. Um, so in this episode, we're going to get to know Lucy and Thailand and hear the best things to do and local tips. And then we'll move on to hearing about her brilliant flight-free summer project. Just a quick note before we start today's episode. There was an issue with my audio in the sort of second sort of middle chunk of the episode uh so if you're hearing a little little bit of difference that's exactly why hopefully you don't hear too much difference so lucy how did you end up living there in thailand oh my dad has an expression which i'm sure lots of people's dads also say which is cut a long story short but then he doesn't (laughs) cut the story short so I'm gonna do that and I'll, I'll cut a long story Good short way to open a podcast <laughs> okay cut a long story short I was in the middle of a PhD I decided to pause it and have a sabbatical in 2019 so I was gonna travel for a year and write for a year in 2020 wow wow um yeah so I uh, I got stuck and I'm using my fingers to make inverted commas because I didn't feel very stuck I loved it I got stuck in India for mm. 17 months for a year and a half almost oh, wow and mm. and by that point I decided I really didn't want to go back to my PhD and writing was going well and living nomadically was going well um but after 17 months India said okay now come on 
<laughs> it's time. <laughs> it's time. No more tourist visas for you. It's time to uh, to move on. So I was having a look around, and Thailand was one of the. To be honest, at the time in 2021, it was one of the only countries that was open, and it was also mm. somewhere mm. for so, like magically I hadn't been to before. You know, everyone goes to Thailand when they're 18 or something, but I hadn't hadn't ever been to Thailand and. I'd met a really great um, fellow solo female traveller when I was first travelling about nine years ago. And she was raving about Chiang Mai. You have to go to Chiang Mai. It's Mm. this really amazing place. And so in the back of my head, I just had this... Someone I'd met and really respected and really sort of liked as a person was just couldn't sing Chiang Mai's praises high enough. So I was like, okay, Thailand's open. Chiang Mai's going to be amazing. That's what I'm going to do. I'd never been here before. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just a, a, a sort of hunch almost. And it was a good hunch. Yes, I love Chiang Mai. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, so did you go just then straight from India to Chiang Mai? Or did you sort of like then go spend some time in Bangkok before you moved on? Or what was the sort of route? Oh, I went from India to Croatia because a friend of right. mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The story is getting longer. I went from India to Croatia because um, a friend of mine runs a, a hostel in Zagreb and Croatia is not in the Schengen zone. So I could go into Croatia because at the time when I had to leave India, India was having a, that really nasty second wave in 2021. Yeah. And yeah. I couldn't come back to the UK without um, paying for, um, what was it, like travel lodge quarantine. So... That's not very right. kind oh, to yeah. travel. Yeah. I think it's actually n- much what like travel lodge would have been a palace in compared comparison to that <laughs> that uh, quarantine. So I couldn't come back to the UK. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I could go to Croatia. So I did that first, and then yeah, came back to the UK from Croatia because it was on the green list. Sorted mm-hmm. out, mm-hmm. sorted mm-hmm. out my Thailand visas. Said hello to my dad and grandmas who remembered me after two years, which was quite a miracle. And bless them, they're very old. They're like 90 and 91. Um, and yeah, I got Hello to Lucy's grandmas. Uh, <laughs> yeah. bless them. And so, yeah, I, I went back to the UK just for a month or so to um, regroup and see everybody. And then I left for Thailand about a year ago. And it was straight to Chiang Mai. Yeah, I had to do... When I first arrived in Thailand in 2021, I had to do hotel quarantine, which was sure. probably the most terrifying day of my life because if you tested positive for covid you had to go into a two-week um quarantine hotel and i was just like no 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 please please." but it was it was fine yeah i I, I stayed in bangkok for that and then got the night train straight to chiang mai so yeah straight here excellent and um and and what do you love most about Chiang Mai? So you've been in Chiang Mai for, I guess, uh, over, about a year or so mm-hmm. now? Yeah, about a year apart from this summer. I love that it's a really big city, but it doesn't feel like a big city. So coming from London, mm. you you probably need a certain amount of things going on. I'm not really ready for living in villages in the middle of nowhere as yet. And you come to Chiang Mai and it's a big city, but it really doesn't feel like a big city. It's very low mm. rise. There's no there's no skyscrapers. There's no big glass buildings that I can mm. think of. No, it's very like low rise, but spreads far and wide and it spreads as far as the mountains and the waterfalls. And so you're in this uh, city that's really surrounded by a lot of nature. You're in really close proximity to nature. So it's a very calming, lovely place, yet has everything you could possibly need. They even have a Uniqlo. They have a Uniqlo. Like, <laughs> everything. So, 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 so a lack of glass buildings, but at but Uniqlo as well. So yes. best of both worlds. <laughs> it's literally, like, Chiang Mai is the best of both worlds, I feel. And I think that quite a lot of uh, nomad workers are onto that. The, there's a lot of co-working spaces here and they're always really full. I think a lot of people choose to live here for that reason. 
Yeah. Yeah, I've I've um, uh, I've got a friend who's who's in the process of moving over there at the minute, and it's 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 sort of as you say, Lucy, just a mixture of I think he's been there in passing, traveling once, but also has just heard so many great things about kind of working there and kind of that modern versus like really kind of quite authentic city as well to kind of live in. Modern versus ancient, like there's thirteenth thirteenth yeah. century temples on every corner, and. You don't have yeah. to. You don't have to go very far to be like in the middle of a jungle, and you like there's a little tiny temple, and you're like, like, you know, what is this place? It's amazing. Wow. Well, let's find out a little bit more about it in our next section. So, right, so Lisa, we're going to move on to the best things to do. So to kick things off, we're going to ask you to give us a quick fire tour of Chiang Mai. So we're going to name a few categories and we're going to ask you then to reply with just one recommend. So are you ready? Yes. Great. Here we go. So your favourite thing to see? The temples. There's over 200. There's somewhere between 200 and 300 temples in Chiang Mai. I I try and go to one or two a week so as not to get temple fatigue. But they are amazing. <laughs> and uh, I'm working on trying to get around as many of them as possible. So I highly recommend doing that. Is there one you keep coming back to? Um, not really. Not as yet. I really, there's a couple that are really, really old. There's one called Wat Yu Mong and another one, Wat Yed Yot, which I am pronouncing mm. completely incorrectly. But they're both um, 13th century, really old Lana Kingdom ones. And then there's another one I really love called Wat Pa Lat, which is... Um, it's one of the ones I was saying to you. It kind of feels like it's in the forest, in the jungle, and mm. I think it was. I think it's only like 150 or so years old, but it it's just the setting is amazing. It's really um, beautiful, kind of idyllic jungle setting. So yeah, I love that one a lot as well. But no, I kind of I'm trying to work my way around them, so I haven't been back to one again and again. Although I live quite close to Wat Passing, which is which is lovely. Oh, um, great! That sounds. Sounds lovely. Um, uh, and uh, next, your favourite thing to drink. And this doesn't have to be alcoholic or anything. It can be it's whatever, <laughs> whatever um, you want. My favourite thing to drink is uh, Thai tea, and you can have mm. it iced. You can have it iced or hot, and it's quite strong tea. I think it's it's black tea, but it's mm. made with lots of lemon and lime and loads of honey. So. Oh, lovely. Yeah, I love it. It's really good. I have it hot or, or cold if it's a really hot day. So you've got to try the Thai, Thai tea, Thai awesome. lemon tea. Great. That sounds lovely. And then your favourite thing, importantly, your favourite thing to eat. My favourite thing to eat is a very typically northern Thai noodle soup called khao soy. And it's quite spicy, although you can ask them to make it less spicy. And it's readily available in just about every corner and every cafe you can find up here in Chiang Mai um less so in the south of the country but you can you can mm-hmm. find cow soy across the whole of Thailand cool um and what makes it like kind of so special you say it can be spicy or not it can be spicy or not it's really um it really varies on where you have it and also I tend to go and have it in vegan restaurants and vegetarian restaurants so it's sort of piled with like tofu and mushrooms but um, I think the regular cow soy has like slices of sort of sausage esque meat on top, and the noodles are so great. They're really kind of mm. like thick, mm. thick, flat egg noodles, big bowl of soup. Mm. You know, like a Studio Ghibli character consumes its soup like it going everywhere. It's very <laughs> messy. It's a very messy business eating cow soy. Never wear, never wear a white t shirt eating cow soy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, good tip. Top tip. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so your favourite sort of day activity uh, when you're around Chiang Mai? Um, there's lots of waterfalls really close mm. by. So you can drive to a waterfall within like 15, 20 minutes. Sometimes there's one called Sticky Waterfall, which is um, the most popular. I'd start there. And then there's mm. lots sort of hidden and tucked away that if you ask locals or if you sort of really zoom in on Google Maps, you'll see um it's a really nice thing to do that sounds lovely can you go swimming there and stuff yeah most of them you can um i would recommend you keep your mouth closed and try not to accidentally swallow any water because you know it's um a friend of mine had a bad time that's all i'm saying okay okay uh, Okay. enough said enough said (laughs) so maybe maybe don't submerge your head 
in the pool, but you can you can get in in the pool and stand under the waterfall. Yeah, excellent, lovely. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And then finally, the um, in our quick fire round, Lucy, your favourite museum or gallery? Um, it's called Mayam, which is M A I I A M Contemporary Art Gallery, and it's a little bit. It's maybe like thirty minutes drive east of uh, Chiang Mai. It's just on the city limits. But it's such a fantastic collection of contemporary art and I studied art and I was doing a PhD in art related stuff. So I feel like you can learn a lot about a place by the art it's making and shows. And a lot of the time artists will say things that people can't publicly say and, you know, you can get a lot Mm. of what's going on. So I love that gallery. It's really beautiful. The whole of the facade of it is covered in mirror, tiny mirror mosaics. Oh, Cool. cool. Really, really nice. Well, that that therefore ends the quick fire round, and that was a super quick fire round. Even though me and Lucy held you up <laughs> with further questions, so <laughs> so well done. You did not fall for <laughs> for our delaying tactics. Um, uh, so I'm going to kind of ask you a bit about like kind of for someone who doesn't know anything about Chiang Mai, never heard of it, never been there before. What would you say are some of the introducing the the city what are some of the most must see sites and experiences that you have to do um that haven't been already been covered in the quick fire round chiang mai old city is a perfect square it still has its 13th mm. century moat and brick walls in places um so and they call that uh, chiang mai old city which is the word Chiang Mai actually means old city. So if you call it Chiang Mai old city, you're saying old city, old city. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, but, I, <laughs> so, but I really, really recommend um, getting a bicycle and riding your bicycle around the old city. It's really, really pretty. And cars are not allowed to drive over, I think it's 30 miles an hour. It's, it's, there's a really, um, maybe even less, there's a really slow speed limit within the old city. So you can cycle around it really safely, um, check out all the street food, which this city is incredible for. And also a lot of the, some of the 200 temples that, um, that I mentioned. <laughs> you, everywhere you cycle around, there's um, monks, Buddhist monks in their orange robes and just somewhere to stop and grab some street food everywhere. So that's my first recommendation. Cycle the old city. I love doing that. It's my great joy in my daily life. That's a great one. Great. We love a city you can cycle through. Definitely. And all hail street food. Sounds wonderful. Yeah, I wanted to ask you a bit more about that, actually, because, yeah, I think that's one of the few things I kind of know about Chiang Mai is like, it's just a haven for kind of like quite authentic Thai food, unlike the metropolis that is Bangkok, where you kind of got everything all in <laughs> all in one city. Um, Chiang Mai is very, very Thai in terms of its food, right? It, I think in terms of its street food, it's very Thai. Um, but there's a really big um, vegan food scene here as well. So mm. first of all, you have the Thai, um, like they call they call them J restaurants, which I think is J A I, and on Buddha's birthday or on your own birthday, you don't eat meat if mm. if you're a meat eater. Mm. So it's your kind mm. of um, your kind of sacrifice of the day to honour Lord Buddha. So they're quite near temples. There's quite a lot of um, vegan restaurants. Sometimes they're not 100 percent vegan. You have to ask them about the what what's in the. Um, broth, but yeah, yeah. yeah cl- classic. But um, I'm not actually vegan. I'm, I'm vegetarian. But when I got here, I was really amazed by the amount of um, vegetarian and vegan cafes everywhere. So off the back of that, I think there's a lot of locals who eat um, because there's so many temples. So a lot of people Mm. come here for pilgrimages. Thai people come up here for pilgrimages. So there's a lot of people who eat in the vegetarian, vegan cafes. But then street food generally is very meaty and very cheap and very good. My friends who eat it tell me, like, you know, you can just grab a quick... Thai equivalent of the kebab, which is just like lots of chicken on a stick, and it's like costs fifty p, and off you go. So yeah, well, there's a lot of amazing street food as well up here. I actually wrote an article about um, how Chiang Mai became so vegan, and mm. a really lovely lady called Lisa who runs the Freebird Cafe, and she's been here for like twelve years, and she said she thinks that more and more vegan restaurants have opened up. First of all, because um, so many of the nomadic workers who are here want that. Yeah. And then mm. it's sort of slowly becoming a bit more fashionable amongst Thai people as well. Like there's a vegan, um, there was a vegan market about two weeks ago here. Okay. here. Mm. So like, it's not just like the foreign folks who come and eat all the vegan food. It's, it's sort of catching on. 
So oh. yeah, it's a bit of a, a bit of a vegan paradise up here as well as all of the very meaty, tasty street food. Excellent. Well, what else do you have? Any other recommends? Yeah, definitely. So um, just to the west of the old city, there's a big mountain called Doisetep, and there's a, a temple, a wat, at the top of Doisetep, which um, which has half of Buddha's, half of Lord Buddha's shoulder bone. Oh. And okay, you, wow. can, you can hike up there. So there's a hike called the Monk's Trail, which you do from sort of sea level down here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a couple of temples along the way. And then when you get to the top, um, up to what the what the view back down over the city is really incredible. If you don't want to hike it, you can get um, one of the uh, song cows, which are like red... Um, minivans they're like open backed minivans and you just okay. you just pay 40 bar which is about a pound and they'll drive you up to the top you can flag them down anywhere in the city if you've given up on cycling or walking and tell tell them the nearest temple you want to go to and they'll take you there for like a pound basically cool so is, is that not a little bit terrifying going up a mountain with an open tops <laughs> open backed <laughs> van yeah they, they, they you have to really hold on to the rails <laughs> <laughs> which I, might be worth I, it in itself that's a bit <laughs> yeah <laughs> Blood pumping. yeah i went on holiday to an island called ko chang which is very hilly it's very mm. very up and down and i had a really like big suitcase with me and i was at the very back near the open back so i was just like holding on to my suitcase holding on to the rail being like oh no we we're all gonna fall out of the back <laughs> but, but you you don't you don't it's fine yeah, yeah, you've lived to tell the tale. So, <laughs> that's cool. That, uh, that sounds like an amazing hike. And uh, anything, anything final on, on Chiang Mai as well? My, yeah, my final favourite thing is the Sunday night market, the Sunday walking Ooh. market. Um, it goes across the width of the old city from Wat Pra Sing right across to the Tape Gate. Um, mm. And it's, it's lovely, even if you're not shopping. There's just lots of food stalls out. There's places to stop and have a foot massage there's places to look at some of the lovely local artwork and craft and things that are made but generally it's for shopping but i just we friends and i we walk along it anyway just to grab a iced tea and see what's what's about it's nice yeah fantastic yeah awesome sounds lovely and then uh, any sort of like final hidden gems lucy anything that sort of listeners might not have heard of well they were willing to share (laughs) yes (laughs) My friends will tell me off for telling everybody. There's um, So there's lots of natural hot springs up here because it's really mountainous. So you can go out to Changdao or up to Pai. Um, and there's, if you enjoy hot springs, if that's the thing you enjoy, which is something I enjoy. But there's yeah. also um, a swimming pool and onsen called Looper. And mm. it's, it's really great. They have like a hot onsen and then a cold bath and a swimming pool and... I love it. That's Looper's the best the local tip, but everyone will tell me off. Don't tell everyone, just, you know. <laughs> Listeners, keep it to yourselves. <laughs> I still want my son bed in Looper, okay, so don't all come at the same time, <laughs> but it's great. It's a really, really good tip. Cool. Okay. And um, before we get on to talk about your flight free travel project and just a final thing on sort of Thailand and Chiang Mai, you've obviously been there for a year. How have you seen that? How has Thailand and Chiang Mai changed during that time? Um, when I got here a year ago, it was really quiet still um, mm-hmm. because of the entry restrictions in 2021. Yep. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people were put off, like certainly um, family groups wouldn't have been coming in. So it was really quiet and people said to me like, oh, you should have seen Chiang Mai a few years ago. It was a party. It was so alive. And yeah, when I got back now, more and more things are opening all the time. I think everyone's really gearing up for having a really nice busy peak season now that there's no relatively no entry requirements. You don't have to do no quarantine of any kind at all anymore. So um, everyone's really excited and prepared to have lots of lovely visitors back this, I guess it'll be like November, December, January, which is Mm. the best time to come to Thailand. It's currently rainy season, so September might be um, for the brave. (laughs) (laughs) So you mentioned about um, the coming months being some of the best times to visit Thailand. Were there any upcoming event highlights that people should be looking out for as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, So 
I believe, and I think most most people who work in Thai tourism would tell you the best time to come is November, December, January, um, for most parts of the country, weather-wise. But also mid-November is Loi Krathong, which mm. is the Thai Festival of Lights. Um, so it's, you know, when all of the paper... Yeah, yeah. Candlelit lanterns are released into the sky. It's really nice, yeah. Uh, it was... Um, quite low key last year, so I ho- I'm hoping this year is going to be like back mm. to its like lantern extravaganza. I'm looking forward to it. I've seen pictures of that of that before, and it looks incredible. Um, yeah. yeah, let's hope it hope it's in full flight this year. Well, that's a lovely introduction to Chiang Mai and and a little bit of wider Thailand as well. And next, we're going to talk uh, in a bit of a break from episode format usually about your flight free summer. Thailand is as diverse as it is beautiful. The extensive coastline and idyllic islands offer the opportunity to dive through vibrant coral reefs, chill out on pristine sand beaches, or enjoy a cocktail with a view. Meanwhile, buzzing cities promise a fascinating blend of ancient and contemporary culture with bustling markets, raucous nightlife, and impressive monuments. Our updated DKI Witness Guide to Thailand transports you there like no other travel guide does, with expert-led insights, trusted travel advice, and detailed breakdowns of all the must-see sites. Find DK Witness Thailand in all good retailers or via the link in our episode bio. So Lucy, can you tell us a little bit more about the Flight Free Pledge and why you decided to make it? I can't take any credit for this. My editor, one of my two lovely editors at The Independent, um, Helen mm. Coffey. Helen yeah. Coffey, um, I think she hasn't been on a flight for three years and she's head of travel at The Independent. So she had a book coming out, which is called Zero Altitude. And... Mm. I got back to Europe and I thought, like, I'm going to give this a go. And I didn't actually initially think I'd last all summer. I was in the UK visiting my dad at the end Mm. of May, early June, and I wanted to get back to Croatia. Um, So I thought, I'm going to try this without flying. And and it was so easy and so fun and so stress-free that I decided I just, I'm not taking, I'm not taking any more flights until I go back to Thailand. And I didn't. So it, it... it was uh, it was three months of uh, planes, no no planes, just trains. I was gonna say <laughs> an automobile, no planes. Yeah, so you so you so this summer you visited nine countries. So how did you do that? Because that's a that's a lot without flights. Can you name the nine countries as well? I can. I absolutely can name the nine countries. Um, so I was in the UK. I took the Eurostar to Paris. Classic. Yep. Stayed with a friend yeah. there, got the Trenitalia Freccia Rossa fast train from Milan to Milan, from Paris to Milan, and then went through the top of Italy into Ljubljana and then Ljubljana to Zagreb, which is actually very close. Zagreb and Ljubljana are about yeah. stones stones throw apart. So that yeah. was that was the five. Went back to Zagreb and picked up a couple of friends and said backpack, um, which was. Oh, backpacking is not for me anymore, but it was a great backpack. I mustn't, I mustn't put it down. It's, <laughs> um, so yeah, and then the Balkans. I spent, I spent a few months in the Balkans, and they are not very well served by train. Mm. Um, so I took buses around the Balkans. So I went from Zagreb to Sarajevo, which is eight hours on a coach, and Sarajevo down into Montenegro. I was cat sitting. Oh, nice. Dear sweet Peach is the kitten uh, for about four weeks, um, just near Kotor. And then I got a bus from Montenegro into Albania, which was also super easy. Started in Skoda in Albania, which is right on really close to the uh, Montenegrin border. And then spent about a month in Albania, which I love. I'm like a, a, a huge fan singing and dancing and shouting about how much I love Albania. And I think I'll actually live there after Thailand, to be honest. Um, mm. I loved it. Loved it. Um, I've, so heard, in, I've heard amazing things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, and also, tr- when you sort of live and work nomadically, you're always like, how long's your visa? Will you give me a freelancer <laughs> visa? <And> so <laughs> that was one of, the first, one of the first things I looked into uh, um, in Albania. I was like, ooh, you can, you can apply for a 12-month visa as a freelancer. And I was like, brilliant. So yeah. Right. Anyway, right. I, dig- oh. I digress. Well, we might we might be talking to you about Albania <laughs> in a few years' <laughs> yeah, time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And then I went from, this was the tough one, actually. I went from Albania to Malta, which is where I went to secondary school and where my mum still lives and my high school mm. friends are all there. And I haven't seen them for three years. And I was like, determined. I was like, right, guys, I'm definitely coming to visit. I'm definitely coming to Malta. This must be achievable because Albania and Malta are not really that far apart. It wouldn't be like trying to go from Albania yeah. to, Lis- to Lisbon. Yeah. And it, it was quite it was quite simple. It was a bit um it was a bit interesting in places, which I'll tell you in a minute. But yeah, I went from I went from uh, Vlora, which is a port quite south, like two thirds down, I guess, Albania, over to Brindisi by ferry, and then got a night night bus, good old Flix bus from Brindisi to Catania. Then I got trains from Catania to Pozzallo. And then the Virtue Ferry down to Malta. It took me 32 hours. Right. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and that takes us to Malta, which is the ninth country. So, yeah. And and then you came back from Malta to Thailand, right? Or? Uh, n- no. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I, I, went, I went from Malta up it, through Italy. Um, and I went from Malta up through Italy. I had a really amazing uh, train ferry. There's a ferry that goes from Messina in Sicily and crosses the strait into Italy. But you can stay on the train. The train goes onto the ferry and there's train tracks on the ferry. And it was very cool. I was very excited. Uh, it's really yeah, that cool. is cool. A train on a, yeah. on a ferry. A train on a ferry. Apparently, the man in seat 61 says there's only three of such or very few that still do this. So I was very excited. And then I was stopped in Naples for a few days to meet a friend. I went up. I basically went up through Italy, back to Ljubljana, back to Croatia, and flew to Thailand from Croatia. Croatia. Wow! So, how many different modes of transport did that ha- encompass? I wrote this down. Hang on, let me let me find this. <laughs> I'm wondering if I've still got it. I did take. Yes, right. So it was three months, nine countries, eleven trains, nine buses. I mean, like long distance buses. Yeah, three three ferries, no flights. Mm. Amazing. That that's great. Yeah. Well done for, with that. Incredible. And do you have any kind of funny stories from your time uh, traveling through? I do have a funny story, which was I. So when I took the ferry from Vlora in Albania to Brindisi in the sort of boot of Italy, I'd googled it and I was quite convinced that there was Uber in Brindisi, and mm. uh, there wasn't. There was no Uber. And there was was no taxis anywhere. So the ferry gets in to Brindisi Port at like 9pm, maybe half past nine. And I was the only foot passenger who wasn't with a car and uh, and came into this port and was just like, okay. There was no buses. I think the last bus had already gone. And it's like an hour walk into Brindisi. So I had to hitchhike with the little old man, sweet, sweet grandpa. <laughs> and it, the sweet grandma was there as well, but she was staying at the port. And I was like, okay, this is fine. I don't love hitchhiking. I'm not recommending it necessarily. I did quite a bit in Albania, but that's a different story. But yeah, sweet grandpa rescued me and drove me into Brindisi, so it was fine. Aww. But I was just like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> One of those things where you're just in a port. Like, uh, were you imagining just, yeah, having to stay there or? <laughs> I, well, I could have walked, but it would have taken a really long time and I had quite a heavy backpack and I didn't want to do that. So I relied on the on the um, generosity of strangers. But it's, I think actually that uh, Helen Coffey, Lenny, was saying that, you know, sometimes you are literally the only foot passenger. She's done it down to Morocco and everyone else yeah. is in their car and they look at you like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Like, why are you walking off this ferry? You know. Like, yeah. So that was that was a bit sketchy, but it was fine in the end. I think you just have to have a bit of faith that it will turn out okay. And I made it in time to uh, the Brindisi bus stop for my night bus, and everything was fine. Yeah. You must have. I mean, you know, I'm sure we could fill a whole podcast episode with your with your stories, Lucy. But it, traveling in this way actually must be really enriching you must come out of it with so many more stories than you were just jumping on and off a plane I really feel like you get a sense of distance and you get a perspective on where you've arrived and you know Mm. going going from like Malta's really hot and quite dusty and Mm. almost North African in its geography yeah yeah. it's next it's next to Algeria and then you know two days later you're in Slovenia yeah you really see like the just the geography change and the land change and it's getting greener and 
and yeah. less humid until then you're basically in the Alps in Slovenia like oh okay you know and you, I, I really enjoy that I think it's it's it feels like a more natural way yes. of traveling to be honest Yes, I can mm. see that. Well, mm. we'd love to really encourage our listeners to travel like this wherever possible. What tips do you have now that you are a seasoned flight-free traveller? Um, I, I mean, I do understand, first of all, that it's not possible for everyone. I work remotely and so I have time and I can work often on trains and I can work in sort of waiting rooms and it's fine. So, um, But if you can spare an extra day, I would say just look into it, But first of all, because you'd be surprised, you might think... Mm. Oh, it'll take me ages to get there by train. But you can get to Italy by train very quickly from the UK. And I sort of feel like it's stress-free. And by the time you spend three hours in an airport, yeah, you just just jump on a train, you know. Yeah. So I, I'd say, look, I, my first piece of advice is if you're tempted, look into it. Because actually, if you take out the time to get to the airport, the time waiting in the airport, it, it probably won't take you much longer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially once you're on mainland Europe or once you're sort of in, in the Balkans or whatever part you're in, a lot of the time it doesn't take much longer. That's the first thing. And secondly, um, my other main tip, get a window seat if you can. Try and pre-book your seat on the bus or the train. Get a window seat so you can, as I was just saying, really look outside and see what's going on and see how the landscape's changing and sort of really absorb it and soak it in because that's a really enjoyable um, part of the whole experience. And make sure you have headphones because you will, if you don't have headphones and there's a, a really loud bus driver playing loud bangers that you don't want to listen to for eight hours, you'll, you'll, you'll be sad. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. That's, that, that sounds like a traumatic experience. That's, that's... <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's two, there's two sites. There's three sites I'd also recommend. There's Bus Ticket For Me, which serves the Balkans. And you can find all of the different local Balkan bus companies um, it's not they're not uh, covered by Flixbus or any of the other big companies so it's it's just bus ticket for me and then there's one mm. in Albania called Giraffe which is G-J-A-F-F-E and so they list all of the buses local buses and coaches so it's quite easy and then of course Rome to Rio although they're not flawless but generally Rome mm. to Rio have good ideas on how to get from A to B Great, Fantastic I mean that's that's super super useful and I saw that well obviously You've just returned to Chiang Mai. I saw that you um, took the train there from Bangkok. Um, it's Flight Free Asia on the card for you next. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I've just been looking into how to get to visit my friend who lives in Malaysia. She lives in Johor in Malaysia. Mm. And I can get, I've worked it out that I can get the night train. Because you can get between Bangkok and Chiang Mai really easily by train. Um, mm. It stops at lots of stops. It's not fast. It's quite... Yeah like a shaky uh, 90s train. However, um, you can either do it by night or take it all day. So this time I came up all day to watch the, what was going on outside, which is like really lovely because you're like rice paddies and then you're on mountains. And you're like, okay, nearly home, there's mountains. But um, the night train is really, really great. It's a little bit bumpy. It's not, you don't get the best sleep, but it, I love it. So I'm probably get the night train back to Bangkok. And then there's a night train from Bangkok into the north of Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And then there's a daytime train that takes you down to Kuala Lumpur. So basically, I could get to Kuala Lumpur from Chiang Mai in like two nights. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Two days. Wow. Yeah. 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 Amazing. That is quite a lot of distance. It is, isn't That's it? A... Yeah. yeah. But, you know, just nap, watch a bit of something on your ipad and then you're there in kuala lumpur yeah so i'm going to try that hopefully end of october i'd like to she's a teacher so she'll have half term then so yeah sort of looking into that brilliant fantastic well we'll, we'll make we'll make sure to follow your journeys and um and and likewise thank you so much for some of your recommendations too i know it's something that we as a sort of team at dk want to try and do more often is is, is travel as flight free as possible um and yeah i think i think there's some some brilliant recommendations there and a little bit of inspiration as well lucy you have one more thing right i have one more thing to say if you have a look on the flight free uk website they mm. have pledges you can make and so there's i pledge to not fly for a year and then there's i pledge to not fly for my holidays or I mm. pledge to never fly again. And you can click which one and sign up to their pledge. Um, and they're sort of counting how, I think they're on almost 5,000 people have taken a pledge with them. So if you, you know, if you just want to click holidays, if yeah. it's not possible for work or 
yeah, they've got a few different options. Excellent. That's a that's a it's a really good shout, and I will certainly check that out. Um, uh, cool. Okay. Well, um, yeah, it's been lovely to have you join us on the podcast, both to talk about Chiang Mai in Thailand and and your flight free adventures too. Um, and yeah, we look forward to seeing where you go next. Um, Albania as well. Al- Albania yeah. pod <laughs> at some point. At some point. Um, and can't wait to follow some of your adventures too. But yeah, it's been wonderful to have you join us, Lucy. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, James. Thank you, Lucy. It was lovely to speak to you. So a huge thank you to Lucy. That was I I really enjoyed the hybrid episode. I really enjoyed that format. <laughs> I enjoyed it too. Yeah, maybe we should get um because we get so many travel experts to, on, on the program on on the show. I think um yeah, actually, exactly. You know, they all have travel tips to give. So maybe this is maybe this is some some early thinking for season five. Listeners, uh, let us know what you think of it um, by getting in touch with us at DK Witness on social yeah. channels, etc. We'd love to hear some of your thoughts on the podcast and and you know what uh, some suggestions for where we should go in the future. Exactly, as well. and sort of modes of travel or different types of tra- themed travel, I suppose. Yeah, definitely let us know. Yeah, special episodes you want, etc. Um, if you've listened to this point, um, you'll have gone through quite a lot with us already. So I'd, we'd be really fascinated to know where to go next. But once again, a huge thank you to Lucy. And actually, you can follow if you're really interested in her future flight free adventures or her, her future life in Albania, if that happens as well. Um, you can find her at Lucy Graces. Um, that's L-U-C-I-E-G-R-A-C-E-S on Twitter and you can also find her on Instagram at 80 Baves that's B-A-T-H-E-S um, so yeah we I will certainly be checking out some of um, I'm really really interested in this Thailand to Malaysia trip and then just seeing where she goes yeah. from there as well definitely yeah fingers crossed for Albania that would be um, a brilliant listen yeah absolutely um, so our next episode Lucy is the last one of the series as we kind of hinted at <laughs> um, yeah uh, so again please let us know uh, some feedback on, on the series we, it's lovely to hear from uh, from our listeners Always. Yes. Um, but it's a really special final episode we are doing Rome I don't know oh, how yeah. we've not done a Rome episode no. set before. And um, Lucy, you're you're really excited because you are particularly fangirling about our guest, right? Yes. So um, Maria Pasquale has written a book called How to Be Italian. And it's honestly a Bible for anyone aspiring like me to be to an Italian. Be Italian. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, yeah, it, oh, honestly, it's the most gorgeous book. Um, so I am, and I went to Rome earlier this year, so I'm super excited. Anyone who knows me knows I love it. I'm super excited. It's going to be a great final episode of the season. Yeah, I, I went to Rome a few years ago too and, and, and absolutely loved it. So um, it should be a real banger to end the season. And um, yeah. So, yeah, um, uh, so listen up for that in a fortnight um, and then we'll take a short break afterwards. So, um, you know, make sure to listen back to some of the old episodes too uh, if you're missing us. And, um, and yeah, but that's all from me today, Lucy. Yeah, and all from me too. Thanks, guys. And thank you very much for listening. Where to Go was produced by the team at Decal Witness and the wonderful Julia Baker. It was presented by James Atkinson and Lucy Richards and mastered by Johnny Coddington at Bottle Rocket Recording. For more information about DK Witness, follow us on social media at DK Eyewitness or visit dk.com forward slash eyewitness. And don't forget to please like, rate, review and subscribe the show wherever you get your podcast. Your support means so much to us.